I'm, on, I'm right here, I believe, so yeah, we can turn that one. All right, you can feel free to come forward, guys in the back, if you want. Um, hello, hello, everybody. Um, thank you, that, Barbara, that was a really nice introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, and I feel the same way about that full circle, and that's what I'm here to talk about. Um, I, uh, it's, it's just been a very inspiring weekend, and I really have enjoyed, I've just really been appreciating hearing what you guys are all doing with your work. Um, makes me very happy, um, and I think Viola would be very, very pleased. Um, uh, so, um, there she is, Viola. Uh, in the 1930s, this was her headshot when she went to New York to study with the group theater. Um, uh, my father, Paul Sills, used to start his workshops um, by asking all the teachers to raise their hands. So roll call teachers, how many do we have here? Every, a teacher of any subject, doesn't have to be improvisation, you don't have to get paid for it, how many? Well, we're, this is, yeah, this is pretty good. Usually, <laughs> Usually in my workshops, it's about 75% because that's what a Spola workshop is all about. We have so many teachers, it's really wonderful. Um, and we got, I think we got closer to 100% here than ever, than ever. You guys might win. Um, so he he would ask, yeah, where are my teachers? And they'd all go, kind of like. <laughs> then he'd tell them a story about how his mother, this woman here, Viola Spolin, found a true teacher named Neva Boyd and how improvisational theater emerged from that opportunity, and he thanked them for sharing the work, because that's how it got out to the world, right? Because they both very much believed it could save the world. So I'm here to tell you that story today, how Viola found a teacher. Um, so uh, we're gonna start by talking about her here, Paul's teacher, his mother, Viola Spolin. And in case you're unfamiliar with her, I'll read you the very first words in her book, Improvisation for the Theater. Oh, I don't even have my copy on me. It's, it's usually nearby. Someone got Deanna, third edition. I would like to add, for those of you who are doing this work, you know, there's lots of editions available now. Third edition, you work from that. Here, we, oh, Deanna has the right copy, of course. Thank you very much. All right, third edition. Uh, um, everyone can act, everyone can improvise. Anyone who wishes to can play in the theater and learn to become stage worthy. We learn through experience and experiencing, and no one teaches anyone anything. <laughs> talent or lack of talent have little to do with it. So what she's talking about here is experiential education, um, something she learned about at Hull House in Chicago. And so we'll, we'll get into that too. Viola was born in 1906 to a family of Russian Jewish immigrants. Uh, let's see, does this work? Here she is as a young girl. Um, uh, she had five siblings and busy parents, so the kids played in the streets, in abandoned construction sites, swinging from the equipment anywhere they could. Um, they made up games and learned games from neighborhood kids. And she was an energetic, totally modern girl. So this is 1920, so she's like 14 here. Here she is, a few years later, and I'll give you a moment with this one. <laughs> take your time, take it in. This is, the, this is the, the girl we're talking about. Yeah. Um, so she was totally modern, right? Uh, she, uh, she went to Lakeview High School in the 1920s where she played basketball. She wore men's overalls with red lipstick and bobbed her hair. Uh, and she ran around with her uh, girlfriends in an old Model T Ford that they all got, they purchased together, um, and they would run up to Lake Geneva and stuff like that. Her nickname was Spark, <laughs> appropriately, right? Um, so yeah, isn't that picture amazing? We, it challenges our uh, preconceptions and assumptions, doesn't it, of what uh, young women were like at that time. This is another picture of her as a young woman to Mama. Love Viola. Um, and here, I love that one. Uh, here you go. Those are the girls. Those are the girlfriends. Chick was uh, Paul's uh, uh, aunt, and is one of those girls is Chick. And Viola is the one holding the gun. Natu naturally. Right. 
All right, Viola told Jeff Sweet, you know, the, the theater historian Jeffrey Sweet, who wrote something wonderful right away. He, he did an interview with Viola, which she would not let him publish. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'll read you a little bit of it here. The estate has allowed him to publish it in his next edition. It's really wonderful. She just wasn't in the mood. Uh, she told him, quote, I don't know how I got through high school. I was so busy with ba basketball and baseball. I tried to get into drama class, but my grades were too low and they wouldn't take me. Yeah, after high school, though, luckily, her older sister Pauline took her to see Neva Boyd, who held classes in group work at Hull House. And also, uh, what we, they called it group work then, we call it social work today. Um, and she had a recreational training school. Let's see, here she is. There's Miss Neva Boyd. Um, and she, Neva Boyd was an early theorist of the uses of play in education and social work. Um, Viola studied with Miss Boyd from 1924 when she was 18 until uh, her first son Paul was born in 1927. Viola said, quote, Boyd taught group work, table games, arts and crafts, folk dancing, Kentucky running races. She traveled all over this country and Europe and brought back games and folk dances and taught them to us. Today, I can still call a square dance. This was maybe the late 70s. She was in her 70s, a Russian Jewish girl from Chicago who called a square dance. She touched everything that was traditional that had the spirit of play in it. Her basic theory was to adjust the child to the existing culture, to adjust them to live happily in the existing environment. Viola began to see how learning unfolded organically through experiencing the world through working with Neva Boyd. And she saw that play was an integrated, near perfect system of learning. Neva Boyd was part of the progressive education movement that had flourished around settlement houses, um, including Jane Addams' famous Hull House, where uh, Neva Boyd worked from. This is in Chicago. Um, and she was influenced by educational writers and reformers like John Dewey. Um, and Neva Boyd ran her recreational training schools there at Hull House, but also at her own house until she would just, you know, use her house as, as the school they'd go there, um, or her apartment. And uh, until eventually her school was absorbed into the sociology department at Northwestern University. So I need, to talk, I need to backtrack a little bit and tell you about Jane Addams. Who here has heard of Jane Addams? We probably, a lot of people here, that's right, this is my crowd. <laughs> All right, but, uh, very often, I give a, a short version of this talk at the beginning of each workshop, and, and very often they've not heard of Jane Addams. And mostly in Chicago, they know a little bit. So for those of you who have never heard of her, she was a remarkable woman. Here she is, a young woman. She inherited a lot of money when she was young, and she dedicated herself to helping the poor. She became one of the leading lights of the progressive era. Um, she was an activist, a social reformer, a public intellectual, and a philosopher. In the late uh, 19th century, waves of immigrants were coming to Chicago from uh, all over and settling uh, well, from Russia, Italy, Mexico, Greece, Ireland, um, and so in 19, I mean, excuse me, in 1889, with her partner, Ellen Gates Starr, she rented a mansion that had long ago been abandoned by uh, the owners because this had, the neighborhood had turned into what they used to call a slum, right? We don't use that term anymore much, but it was, it was, and this is where, it was smack dab in the middle of an intersection of a lot of different immigrant uh, communities. And they called it Hull House after the name of the man who had built the house originally. And they offered an array of classes for all ages um, and lectures and community activities uh, uh, and social services. Um, their idea was to help integrate the residents of the near west side into American culture and help alleviate the, you know, the crushing effects of poverty. Uh, and the needs were huge. There was something like a 40% child mortality rate at that time. You know, children were working in factories. Uh, uh, and so these were wealthy women <laughs> from a different class. Um, and so they came in with an idea of what was needed. Um, but they, they lived there. They actually lived in Hull House and they became members of the community. And so they learned from the community what was actually needed and it changed over time. Um, but they, their, their goals went 
needs beyond only meeting the immediate needs, which were quite vast. Um, but they ran to the betterment of all aspects of community life. Like the first building they built outside of Whole House was an art gallery <laughs> because they believed in the arts as a way to uplift the human spirit. Um, kids and adults could study and practice art and ceramics, music, dramatics. Um, the little theater and community theater movements can be traced directly to Whole House. They came right out of Whole House. People would actually be in drama clubs like kids from the neighborhood would join a drama club starting at age six and be in it their whole lives till they die, where they get together once a week with some, you know, their club and put on Shakespeare or whatever. Um, and so Adams and the work she did at Hull House, um, they're, they're, they're partially responsible for many of the reforms of the progressive era that we've until recently mostly taken for granted, like child labor laws, women's suffrage, trade unions for women, compulsory education, juvenile courts, public playgrounds, improvement in working conditions all over the place. Um, it just goes on and on. So once she was, once Adams was in the community and listening to the problems and concerns of the people uh, who lived there, she began to see the systemic injustices that kept poor people poor and she got kind of radicalized. Um, and she, she realized they would have to move beyond charity work. She got, at that point, she, she realized she would have to get into public policy and change laws. Um, uh, but if you recall, women still couldn't vote, right? So that was one of the first things she had to figure out was how to get women to vote, uh, the right to vote. And she worked on that. And then they just kept working. Um, they were changing laws at the state and national level. Um, but she organized people. She knew how to do that. She lobbied, she advocated, she listened, and she provided spaces for groups to come together. That was her, you know, you know what, one of the things she was capable of doing. Um, and she became an activist through that. She was a co-founder of the ACLU, the NAACP, and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Uh, all of those organizations are still in existence. Uh, and she was the first woman, woman to win a Nobel Peace Prize for her anti-militarism activism, which is actually what turned the American public against her, which is so telling, right? Anti-war activity were, uh, but so I'm, I know I'm going into detail here, but it's important right now, you know, as we're, as we're watching the 20th century be repealed before our very eyes, we're going to have to fight these battles all over again. But she's someone who can help show us how, um, you know. Um, so, but back to Miss Boyd. We'll, um, we'll head back to the subject. Jane Adams was a supporter of Neva Boyd's work and, and on the board of her school. And so you begin to see the Viola's luck at meeting this great teacher was what it just wasn't chance. It was because there was a community of people who came together. Um, a, a lot of them women too. A lot of them uh, gay women. It was uh, the whole house was uh, among other things a gay safe space. Um, and uh, uh, hidden, obviously, right? But, uh, but that's lively participatory democracy where all people de deserve access to education. That, that education is a liberatory force, right? Um, and that not only that, democracy doesn't function without that. But back to, back to our Miss Boyd. Um, there's a story that I like to tell that sort of demonstrates what she was like as a teacher. Um, she noticed that a school near her house had just torn out all the trees and plants from their playground. Um, and she'd been an early advocate for uh, uh, playgrounds. They didn't even have these. The first playground, uh, public playground um, in Chicago was right across the street from Hull House. It's now a parking lot for UIC. But, um, <laughs> the, but they didn't, nobody thought kids needed playgrounds, right? But she had advocated for them and she trained playground workers. And so this, and, and she belie they believed that children deserved access for the, to the natural world, right? And so she was really sad. But at that moment, nothing, she couldn't do anything about it. So she sat down with a group of children on the front steps of the school nearby and told them folk tales. <laughs> And the children uh, listened, and uh, when she finished, one of them asked her, couldn't we come to where you teach? <laughs> of 
Qu social living, Neva Boyd wrote, cannot be maintained on the basis of destructive ideologies, domination, hate, prejudice, greed, and dishonesty. A society cannot hold together without a good way of life for all. Virtues are dynamic products and cannot be taken over fully developed without being continuously developed. And then she also wrote, play involves social values, as does no other behavior. The spirit of play develops social ad adaptability, ethics, mental and emotional control, and imagination. They become habits of meeting situations happily. So she said, I talked about a bit about this last night, that, that idea that children learn to work out their differences through play, because they share a common goal, right? To keep the play going, just to keep playing. Um, and not that it's so easy, but it's a process, and how else are they going to learn it? Um, but when Boyd writes about social values, she's in conversation with Jane Addams there. Uh, her, Jane Addams had a, uh, wrote a book called Democracy and Social Ethics. Um, and the, the idea, the basic idea is that democracy functions best if we all get out of our own spheres, cultural, religious, uh, uh, racial, uh, class, you know, whatever they may be, uh, and meet people who are not like us and get to know their needs and concerns. Uh, Jane Addams wrote that, quote, a standard of social ethics is not attained by traveling a sequestered byway, but by mixing on the thronged and common road where we all must turn out for one another and at least see the size of one another's burdens. And so uh, Neva Boyd was saying, play does this. <laughs> um, uh, uh, she, she did become a major figure, Boyd, in the training of social workers. Many of you probably have, you, know, you, she, you can visit her archive, I think it's in Texas. Um, but she is not often given enough credit for her role in the history of improvisational theater. Um, so hopefully, if you uh, don't already, you'll all go look for her Handbook of Recreational Games. It's very helpful in workshop. Um, and in a Spolin workshop, we start every workshop with a game that she gathered, that Neva Boyd gathered. So after training uh, with Neva Boyd, um, Viola worked with a lot of recent immigrants, orphans, church groups, and lots and lots of neighborhood kids. She described one job on an early resume as folk dancing and group therapy for working girls. So she was working with groups of all kinds, wherever she was needed. Um, but from childhood, Viola was drawn to the theater. Uh, she said, my father was a Chicago policeman. He was on opera detail. He took us to the opera all the time, and I fell in love with it, especially when it snowed on stage. La Bohème. That was pretty exciting theater for a kid to see. And I was a super once in Boris Gudunov with Charlie Oppen. I did my first play when I was 10 years old, wrote, produced, costumed. For admission, I charged a penny or 10 pins. I don't know how I came up with 10 pins. Certainly a penny would have been more useful. That was Viola. Here she is, I like this one. This is she, she, her, she and her girlfriends, Chick. There's Chick again, uh, Chick Silverberg, my, uh, Paul's aunt. Uh, putting on a show, clearly there's some sailor pants and banjos and cigarettes and looks like a good one. Um, she came from a big extended family. They were all pretty much except for one grandma, they were all Russian Jews, and there was an Irish, Irish uh, uh, mother-in-law, I guess, um, who all got together and sang songs. They played charades and put on shows. Uh, Viola said, every Sunday, we'd take the streetcar and meet at somebody's house. Nobody had babysitters. They always sang, they always danced, and they would make up the funniest operas. I remember I had a friend, a very proper English girl. She came with me one time and said to me, I didn't know people did things like this in their house. <laughs> so she, she can't, here's Viola looking very proper. That's another teenage. She's about 14 here. Her brother George, uh, who would become a state senator, described a family gathering for which Viola and her siblings and cousins wrote and performed a three-act play about their aunts and uncles harrowing escape from Russia complete with costumes and sound effects, like rumbling sheets of tin to, you know, you know, to stand in for the Cossacks, and all ending happily in a double wedding in Chicago. 
And afterwards, they improvise scenes in which uh, he said Viola, Viola was, was doing these great impersonations of aunts and uncles. So this was the family tradition that Viola came from. And you'll note that phrase, nobody had babysitters, right? The family unit in could include play for entertainment before television and all that. Um, and in the 1930s, Viola majored in dramatics at DePaul's night school. Here is... She, this is from the newspaper, uh, Viola Sills has a noted role. Um, she studied at the Goodman Theater and with the group theater in New York. Um, she acted and worked as a stage manager. She absorbed knowledge about the theater in every way possible for a divorced, a by now divorced mother of two. Uh, and naturally, she began to teach dramatics, uh, working mostly with recent immigrants uh, with limited English skills or with children and lectures and traditional training and the, all the ways that she had been taught acting, even though a lot of it was Stanislavski and lively and fun, but she it used its own ter terminology that wasn't helpful for the people she was working with. And she realized that, you know, none of that was going to help her in her classroom, working with her students. Um, but she knew from her training with Neva Boyd that play would solve all those problems. Uh, as she said of Miss Boyd, the effects of her inspiration never left me for a single day. Every time Viola encountered a problem when directing her players or working with them in workshop, such as not being able to hear them, that'd be one example, or them being afraid to touch each other. You know, there's a million things. The way they hold their hands all over the place, all that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, she created a game with a focus to help them learn through playing. And through play, her students discovered not just that they should share their voices with the audience, because the teacher told them to, but why they needed to, that they, to include the audience, to make sure that they were, were heard. And so as they learned through doing organically in their bones, they, they, uh, uh, and through experience, um, that it helped them overcome the, whatever the shyness or the self-consciousness that solved the problem in the first place. Right? And as we know, true play helps the player enter into the present time, uh, right? With, with, with all our senses and our intuition activated. Um, it's, so it's a state, that's the state that we're always trying to get our students into, right? As, as uh, side coaches. Um, because it allows your, stu your players to solve complex problems without thought, without thinking of them. Um, or, and in that, in that state, you know, we're liberated from the mental chatter, the conditioning, anything that holds us back. Um, as Viola said, through spontaneity, we are reformed into ourselves. <laughs> Uh, so Viola would eventually create hundreds of theater games over her lifetime. And they actually amount to a complete actor training method, uh, if, if you do them, uh, all of them, which most of us don't do. We just dip in and do a few. Um, and a non-authoritarian teaching method, which I urge everyone here to go and explore. Um, I find it still incredibly radical and it, ahead of its time, her teaching method. Still difficult to work with. Um, for the teacher and yet ultimately incredibly liberating for your students on a, uh, a, a personal level as well. So in the late 30s, um, Neva Boyd recommended Viola to the WPA to be a drama supervisor. And Viola rented space at Hull House, just like her teacher, and uh, she, w she would sometimes have to literally go into the street and round up the kids to get them to play, to get them involved with her program. Um, here is a picture. This is a picture of Viola directing on the Hull House stage. Look at all those kids. They've got their scripts. And I love how there's like every sort of uh, uh, attitude in the rehearsal process is represented in those children, right? Um, but that is Paul Sills in the middle with the script on the, in the short pants on the piano. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? that that exists. Um, and Viola said, I remember trying to get boys to join the group. I don't want to, they said. I want to play Hi-Ho Silver. So come play Hi-Ho Silver on the stage, she said. 
Uh, so they came in and they played high ho silver, silver till I was about to die. <laughs> Some of you may know the feeling. And then they, they gave it up and worked. This is an article um, from 1940 uh, about her work. Let's see if I can read. This is about uh, organized recreation for children takes many unique forms, none more unique than what is being done at Hull House. Aimed at stirring creative ability inherent in all children, it's a program of unorthodox drama that hews to no lines, knows no cues, and never heard of a rehearsal. The youngsters are given a bare idea, characters are chosen from the imp and the impromptu play begins. It's fun, stimulates reading, eliminates the dis, dat, and doze from the children's speech. Are these young thespians good? They're the finest ad-libbers the stage has ever seen says director Viola Sills Full. And, um, this, the, it, her performances with children at Hull House are, are some of the very first recognized times that suggestions were taken from the audience to create performances. So these kids, these neighborhood kids, these are all your improvisational ancestors, right? You get it. Today's news is tomorrow's play. Here, 11-year-old Leonard Kerfman reacts as he imagines anyone would in an air raid up, up there. And in this one, uh, oh, they're ad-libbing an emotional, the, uh, the diaper, that one's called. They were, they were, they were actually, their stuff was coming out of their own lives. Um, when the villain comes to collect the mortgage on the old homestead, Grandpa, Vincent Lombardo, 12, and Jeanette Catapano, 11, just stepped up and bopped him one. <laughs> so, and he sort of, he sort of says they have improper costuming and stuff like that. He's like, you know, but uh, that looks pretty good to me. We're amazed to see costumes at all, right? Um, there's another amazing quote. It's on our, the bio at violasbullen.org um, about a show that Viola directed. And it was, it was written by um, someone, uh, and, and the script doesn't exist. But it was, uh, it's worth going to read. I should have I just gotten the description for you here, but... Um, they I do believe they improvise parts of it. Every uh, immigrant group, and by Viola's time, um, there was, uh, uh, er they would all, there was like every, there was, uh, there was like a train, the, it was about a train, and there were like hundreds of people in this show, and it would stop in every neighborhood. So it would stop in Greektown, in, in the Italian section, in the black neighborhood. Um, uh, and uh, Russian Jewish, and and there were it was this whole big, huge, integrated, improvised, and written thing put on entirely by the people themselves. It sounds like an amazing event, um, but this is the kind of stuff they were up to at Hull House. Um, so I'll read you a little bit about how she developed um, her games, um, because it might be of interest to you guys. I'm sure you're working on a lot of you know, you know you, when you see a problem. I'm sure you're working on this. She, here's, a, here's a quote about how she developed a game called Stage Picture, which helps players essentially to block themselves, right? Which is an amazing thing. When a, when a group of people can begin to do that with themselves, they can begin to devise their own theater, right? If you, um, she, they, they ascend, through playing, they learn to understand where they are in relation to their fellow players on stage and to every member of the audience. It's a remarkable thing. Um, this was at her Young Actors Company in Hollywood, where she taught and directed a professional children's company in the 1940s and 50s. Um, she, quote, I'd need something or something wasn't happening. That's how she would develop her games. I remember Alan Arkin was with me when he was a kid for a few months in California. And a friend of mine sitting next to me said, you ought to have him right stage. You've got to say it like that, because it's just like... <laughs> Do we still say right stage anyway? I love that. You ought to have him right stage. And I said, yes, I know I should. Well, why don't you get him right stage? I haven't figured out how, said Viola. <laughs> what do you mean you haven't figured out how? I'm not going to tell him to go to right stage. He has to figure out for himself. <laughs> uh, um, uh, and then I, uh, so... Uh, that maybe that's where share the stage picture came from, she said. At first I would name the person so-and-so, share the stage picture, and then I realized it was everybody's responsibility to share the stage picture. And that's what that game is all about. And it does a lot of work in a short amount of time, right? 
Um, and so just because uh, you guys might appreciate this, here's some pictures of her. This is her in that period of her Young Actors Company. Um, this is 1946. This is her working. They would do, it was a children's repertory theater as well. They would do elaborate productions. Um, and this is her backstage. I think this is from Once Upon a Clothesline where they all, it was all took place in a backyard. And there, the Alan Arkin is the child in the middle with those Spock-like eyebrows. Um, but, and his brother, I think that's his brother too. I don't know what they did. They, they gave him a little makeup there. These are children pretending to be dolls, you know, you know, and look at their bodies. I mean, just, um, and that clown up there, that's Paul Sand, who some of you may know from the second cast of Second City, and he won a Tony for Paul Soul Story Theater on Broadway. He worked with Viola from when he was nine years old. So some good actors came out of this training, I have to say. <laughs> um, this is another, that's Jackie Joseph. She was a, a television and film actress la in later life, and Paul Sand is to the right. But look at these productions. Um, and they were very popular, too. And I just love to see the movement, always with the movement reflected. Oh, I went a little too far. Let's see. We'll go back. All right. So uh, that was just, there's many, many more beautiful pictures of that. But I wanted you guys to see what she was up to in that period. She published this lifetime of research at, in 1963 as improvisation for the theater. Thank you, Deanna. The book that launched the improvisational theater movement in the U.S. And, in, and it also transformed and in some way democratized the American theater. And true to her original training as a social worker, Viola's theater games have gone on to be used in all, you guys just tell me where you're, countless fields, you call out what you're doing with them, right, or with improvisation. Um, psychology, English, religion, mental health, uh, and on and on and on. All this to help doctors and scientists communicate. Anyone want to throw anyone out, anything out there? What are you doing? Property, oh, that's a new one to me. Uh, yeah, that's fun. People were working with lawyers and politicians, I heard. What? Law, yeah. <laughs> I, have, oh, I forgot to mention a student who actually, I didn't know she was in the audience last night, who is a immigration rights attorney, and I'm so happy she's uh, doing uh, that too. Helping to train, oh, yes, wonderful. Thank you, thank you all. Emergency managers, yes, fantastic. What a good idea. This is great. Say that one more time. Revisioning research. Yes. Um, Viola also created two sons, um, and her. Fr I, it's, it's sometimes I even forget to talk about Paul, because there's just so much to talk about. Um, but uh, her firstborn was Paul Sills. And I skipped ahead a little. And thanks to her, Paul was born into the theater. And that is Paul sitting on the lap of Neva Boyd. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> look at that baby, though, for a minute, too. Look at his eyes. <laughs> uh, he's already directing someone. I don't know, but but this is a love. This it's it's hard to believe this exists. But there he is drinking at the mother's milk of play. Um, uh, but and Viola would invite all her. But you, there, she she wrote about this. There was a time when she couldn't work because she had these a, a baby. So she would invite all her girlfriends over to her apartment uh, for game nights, um, and they would just prop the baby on the bed because uh, remember no babysitters. Nobody could afford that. And um, so she, she once said, quote, I think that's where Second City began. People used to say, you guys ought to rent a theater, because they were so hilarious. I think Paul absorbed a lot of this as an infant on the bed. <laughs> so Paul went on to become the founding director of Playwrights Theater at the University of Chicago um, uh, at, with David Shepard and Ed Asner and Mike Nichols, Elaine May, Barbara Harris, Joyce and Byrne Piven, and many more wonderful players. And he co-founded Compass with David Shepard, and which is considered the first improvisational theater company. Um, in, uh, let's see, here he is in that period. There's, um, I've zoomed in once. There, it's Lucky Strikes, obviously. Um, but Shakespeare, <laughs> Shakespeare and Lucky Strikes. I can't figure out what the book on the bottom is there. 
Uh, Paul said in 1955, quote, compass, if carried to its logical conclusion, is a sort of do-it-yourself movement. I'd like to see neighborhoods all over the city form groups like this. It's a search for community. <laughs> uh, it's a little prophetic, that statement, isn't it? Um, but And also talk about a boy who spent a lot of time at Hull House. He always talked about community. I think it was the word he said most. Um, in 1959, Paul co-founded the Second City, as its and as its director, he provided the artistic inspiration for the theater while he was there. Is there about five years? Here he is, there, smoking again. Sad. This is this is it did not things did not go well at that rehearsal. It looks like, but um, I never knew him to be a smoker. He quit by the time. But every, people sometimes ask me, "Did your father die of lung cancer?" Because there's a lot, of, a lot of these pictures of him smoking. No, I no, but luckily he quit. Um, uh, he, I'm going to fast forward through the history of Second City and Compass because that stuff's readily available, and I'm going to move into stuff that uh, actually that he loved to talk about. Um, but here's a night. Unfortunately, this is a little small. This is a Second City photo I really love. That's Paul and the producer Bernie Solins in the front. Um, Paul's the one with the very large head. And, um, but there's Viola on the left. And you don't often see, uh, can you see her here? Yeah. You don't often see her in these pictures. And my, that's Severn Darden um, on the left on the top. But he married my, uh, my Aunt Heather Carroll's sister. My mom Carol's right next to them. I don't think, I think this is the only picture that exists with all of them in it. And many wonderful people you'll recognize. Um, uh, that's Del Close on the right, and some uh, uh, Dennis Cunningham, and who went on to become a very, very pivotal civil rights lawyer after being a Second City bartender and player. Um, so let's see, what else do we have? Oh, Viola is the director of workshop at Second City, and this is a picture from her workshop. It's just beautiful by uh, Morton Shapiro, who took beautiful pictures in that era. And she, she waited until after seeing Second City to publish improvisation for the theater. Because she, at that point, she saw her work in action with some really amazing players. And, it, it, and so she found new things there with them. And uh, new games uh, were developed. Uh, Paul was directing Second City in New York in 1963 when uh, John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, or was it 64? Anyway, you guys, will, you will fe you'll forgive me. Oh, good. All right. I got it right. In he was inspired. He, the civil rights movement was happening, and that had really got him um, worried about the direction the country was taking. And he returned home, uh, back to Chicago. And th that would have been the period he was working with Alan Alda in 63. Um, so that was interesting. We sort of worked that out last night. I was trying to figure out. I talked to him a few minutes before. When was this? And what a period. What an amazing group of players they had together. Wow. Was it Olympia Dukakis and Jane Alexander? Incredible. Um, so that was a very uh, productive period in New York. But he wanted to return home quote, in search of community, he wrote again, um, because he, he wanted to see what was going on. He gathered friends and activists and actors to play Neva Boyd's traditional games uh, in Lincoln Park. So this is how they thought, wh how are we going to get back into our community? Let's play some games in the park. And it was summer, so they could do that. And when it got too cold, they moved inside and played Viola's theater games. Um, he was seeking, as he told an interviewer in 1964, quote, something that has the sense of the great periods of your youth when you're working with people. This great sense of being part of a group that's fun, only on an adult level. Well, you say, how do you do this? The community theater should be more interested in the community than the theater. <laughs> Isn't that a good line? Write that down, everyone. The community theater should be more interested in the community than the theater. Sorry, I have allergies. That was uh, Read Plato, Samuel Butler, Martin Buber. In talking about space, Martin Buber has said, in effect, that the stage is the creation of a sacred ground. The meaning of the ritual theater is that what you do is real, not symbolic of what is real. 
And here he starts talking about his players. The actors train themselves and work at handling imaginary objects so that they're good at it. They can make an agreed stage space where the th there are real things. When you get actors who are capable of doing that, you get actors who are capable of connecting with each other because they have made an agreement that together they can both create reality. A guy puts his hand out, and that's a soda fountain spigot. Uh, the other puts the glass underneath. They have made a tacit agreement that they are together in a drugstore. It's Orpheus. They send a poet into the nether region, and he comes back with a message. Therefore, the only thing I, that I can see is the game. At least games are where the actors are that night, in the room, with the audience. I've seen it, and it's more exciting than anything. The recognition sweeps over everybody that they're all there. Wow, that's the theater, unquote. And it, 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 in this interview, he goes on to talk about how he was going to turn Second City into an all-theater game, like improvised format, which is so interesting. Um, but he, did, he, he thought better of it. He moved on. There were, he, he, um, uh, and with Viola, Carol, my mom, Carol Sills, and members of their community, he started the Game Theater in Chicago in 1965. Um, let's see. And here's their logo. Uh, check out the audience players, audience players there. Um, they played, uh, you know, true to their name, they played theater games. And they took suggestions from the audience, and the audience members participated. It was a total community experience. And Viola would often run the game nights. Um, the uh, Women for Peace and the Northside Cooperative Ministry met there. They founded a co-op school, because uh, they'd had a family now and had children. Um, and so the parents would teach the school. It was an arts-based curriculum. But it was in, in the bar at the game theater. So once the city realized they were running a nursery school in a bar, they had to move. <laughs> they didn't mind. We, you know. um, there's Viola at the game theater. This is a picture I found on a proof sheet. What do you call this? And I is zoomed it up, so it's not great quality. It's of an audience doing a spacewalk before, sh like, as part of the show, right? The audience would just get up and do a spacewalk. But if you'll notice that I was like, that guy looks like Roger Ebert. Do you see the one? I yeah, so it, it is. We, my, my mom sent it to his wife. Um, and it's sure enough, that, well, that was the kind of neighborhood place it was. You know, you'd go to O'Rourke's, then go to the game theater. Um, it was a place where both Paul and Viola really explored their visions of a true community theater. Uh, and, and they also really got to explore the theatrical discoveries that were made by playing Viola's theater games. Um, and how the players and the audience Everyone was transformed by those explosions of spontaneity that happens when the intuition is tapped. By 1968, the game theater had closed for a variety of reasons. Wait, one more. This is Paul at the game theater. You can see the space in those hands, right? You can see that's a nice. Um, uh, some space shaping going on. He looks a little grumpy, but... Um, uh, the, it had closed by 1968 for a variety of reasons. Um, people all, it tend to move on and that kind of thing. I, um, uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated, and then Bobby Kennedy and the Democratic Convention, National Convention, was going to be held in Chicago of that summer. And thousands of students were coming to town to protest the Vietnam War. And Paul was asking himself how the theater could be relevant at such a time. And some of you may be asking yourself that question right about now. Um, and he, he said he thought of a show where they could put the Democratic Party on trial uh, for getting them into Vietnam in the first place. Uh, but then he wrote, this battle for the soul of the people was beyond satire, unquote. He, read, he happened to read the Grimm's brother's story, The Blue Light. And he saw it, he's, he wrote, I, quote, I saw it on stage in the space then and there without the need to change a word. 
Stage space is capable of transformation without mechanical scene changes. As we knew from working with Viola Follin at Second City playing the game Transformation of Relationship. Um, in the blue light, in, the, in that story, there's an old soldier who's all be beaten up and wounded, so he's kicked out of the army because he can't serve the king anymore. And um, on his journey home, he's tricked by a witch who traps him in a well. And he realizes there's no escaping out of the well, um, but he still has a pipe. Uh, and so he lights it, um, thinking all is lost. He might as well have one last smoke. Quote, and lo, a little gray man appears and offers to do his bidding. This is a motif in fairy tales, the power that's given from nowhere, just when nothing seems possible. In the depths of the despair, there lies the spark, the transformation of reality. The soldier gets his revenge on the king and triumphs over all authority and power. And when the paternal power was overthrown in the highly charged political situation of 68, the young people cried, right on. <laughs> it was just in the air. This is the story theater cast in 1968 with the, in the beer garden of Second City, because that was just about to be torn down. And that's, that's um, Joyce Piven on the right, Warren Lemming, Eugenie Ross Lemming. Um, and th uh, that's Cordis Fire. You like, you like the, uh, the Nehru jackets are nice, right? Uh, that's Paul on the left in the Nehru jacket. Um, and then here's the audience. The show was free because they wanted everyone to come from the community it was for. That's what they really believed in. And so this was the audience all lined up. And that girl is holding a Doors record. Um, and because it was free, the kids came too. So it was like all, all ages. They always joke that that guy was a narc. I don't know. There was like a kind of, they were definitely, they definitely had FBI files by this point for having things like women's meetings and stuff like a nursery school and a bar, that kind of thing. Um, so uh, during the week of the convention, the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, he wrote, the police chased demonstrators out of Lincoln Park right to our gate but did not enter. Like the churches of the neighborhood, the theater was somehow a sanctuary off limits to police, unquote. And I talk about the theater as a sacred ground. Um, stories, Paul believed, teach us of our own innate and hidden power. Our ability to o overcome insurmountable odds. And through them, uh, he believed, we, are, we learn we are possessed of a self that's capable of personal liberation, right? Once you get, once you come to, so for him, this was his belief, personal liberation um, to Paul paved the way for political liberation. Quote, Cinderella is not allowed to go to the dance. Simpleton cannot be permitted to go into the forest to chop wood. But these most miserable creatures do overcome. This is real teaching to my mind. All these heroes do what is on the face of it impossible. Build castles in a single night or die and come back to life. And in this way, stories point to the seemingly impossible task each of us is assigned to become who we are intended to be, the surprise self. And Viola, they, uh, Viola uh, said, story and games bring out self rather than ego. Right? Story Theater went to Yale, the Mark Taper. This is the, uh, the for a forum in Los Angeles and then on to Broadway and TV in Canada. That's what Alan Alda was in, the, t the Canadian TV show. This is the Broadway Story Theater cast. These were all amazing improvisers. That's basically how you got cast by Paul. You can play theater games. Um, but that's Paul Sand and Valerie Harper, Mary Fran, Richard Libertini, Peter Bonners. Is that Dick Shaw, I think? And Hamilton Camp. Yeah. Paul was a student of the American Revolution. He read and wrote extensively about his heroes, Joseph Warren and Samuel Adams, whose words about self-direction and the spirit of liberty rang true to him because they were in philosophical alignment um, with his and his mother's vision of an improvisational theater. And he adapted and directed two shows from historical documents of the American Revolution uh, that were performed in, and this is, oh, this is Valerie Harper and, uh, and Dick Shaw, and that, I think that's Mary Fran in the back, in Ovid's Metamorphosis on Broadway. Um, I think that's Io, and Juno has just turned her into a cow. Um, and this is Paul directing just uh, Story Theater in Chicago in 1980. 
That's what he looked like when he directed. Did anyone here see that? <laughs> anyone know it in this audience? Um, he, he danced a lot when he directed. He was always like physically communicating the sublime, what he wanted, and yelling. He yelled too. But there's this, but people talk about that, but they don't talk about this. But that's what I, that's what I remember that he looked like when he directed. So he did, he did, uh, he also did these American Revolution shows, which I wanted to tell you about because people don't really know about that history anymore. Um, and they were all from source material. But it was, it was his commitment to talking about, uh, you know, where this country came from and where it could be, those ideals. Um, this was a poster for Sweet Bloody Liberty. Um, and it told the story of Crispus Attucks, and it, it was, it was uh, these shows were difficult because the source material is difficult. Um, but someday we got to get them back up. Paul wrote about this show, uh, quote, we came before our conscience in protests against tyranny during the 1960s. The fact that the show's actors who lived through that period have been able to speak in truth and reality the words of their forefathers points to the way Americans must take if we are not to become a nation of tame and contented vassals, as Samuel Adams warned of. No one in America can escape the consequences of our creation of a, as a people intended to live together as free. If we do not struggle personally for liberty against tyranny, we deny our personal existence and submit to chains. I used to think he was being a bit hyperbolic. I don't know anymore. Um, he was also an inspiring and passionate teacher of his mother's work until the end of his days. He used to say, honor thy mother. <laughs> and he, he told us she had a teaching that would outlast us all. And he found connections between the practice of theater games and literature and philosophy that he loved to read. The Tao. Shuang Tzu, Shakespeare, Martin Buber, Thoreau, Rumi, Emerson, those were, and, and, and what Aldous Huxley called the perennial philosophy. Uh, that, that focused attention is a way out of the human predicament, as uh, Viola called it. That's, that was her phrase. Or as she would say, a way to get out of the head and into the space. Paul said, quote, I am a son of Viola Spolin. So I was in some of her theater game workshops at Hull House, Chicago. It was her influence which led me to read book after book of fairy tales from many cultures. Since she was the student of Neva Boyd, who taught traditional games and folk dances at her recreational training center. Here, let's, we'll give you him talking as we do it. Um, give you some of the idea. Um, I came in for a lot of playing, he said. All of this has stood me in good stead on my journey, unquote. Jane Addams once wrote, the creative power in the people themselves will come out only if it has a chance, unquote. We, all of us in this room, are very lucky that Viola was given that chance through Neva Boyd, her teacher, right? Viola, she wrote privately that where she broke with the progressives um, and I, I was the, over the idea of adjusting the child to the existing culture. Right? She, was after, she, she said, I, was at, I wanted transformation. Right? Transform the child, transform the culture. We have a lot to learn from the progressive zone. We can learn, we can learn from their mistakes, too. Um, and I think they would have been right there with us, knowing what we know now. Um, true education is follow the follower, right? We learn from each other. We learn from our players. They learn from us. And in, that, in so doing, we're all changed. And that change can ripple outwards. I think Neva Boyd would have been would have agreed if she had she never got the chance to play Mirror and follow the follower. I bet. Um, so there is no more Hull House as Viola knew it. It 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 closed as a social services organization in 2012. Um, due to state budget cuts, it be, it become almost entirely dependent on state funding, and we know what's been going on in Illinois. So um, it was closed. It was still serving like 30,000 people a month. Um, so there's still the need, but there's just no Hull House as a social services organization anymore. Um, it's a museum now, and it's a wonderful one, and I hope you all visit because it is the site of, of the Big Bang. And it is, they're aware of it now. I've been working with them a lot, and they're really excited about that connection. Um, it's part of our collective history. But what still exists are your classrooms. 
and your programs and your groups where you get people together. Uh, so guess what? Tag, you're it. That's how it goes. You're Hull House now. So it's up to you to make sure the next Viola is given a chance to transform the world. Um, everyone here today is a direct descendant of this lineage. Even if you did another form of improvisation, you still, you count. Now you know. Service, community, and the healing potential of play and communication, are ju they're just built in. And Viola knew it. Um, she would not have been surprised by this movement, um, she, but she'd be grateful. All through her life, she worked with groups outside of traditional theater programs. Um, and in her later years, she worked with prisoners, and she worked with patients in hospitals, including catatonic patients, where, and she, she, she saw them benefit from, I don't know what games she did, but um, she, she found ways she adapted, probably just like you do to your students, right? Um, one of her students from the late 70s told me Viola only wanted to work with, with hospital patients at a certain point, and she would let them teach the actors. Um, she knew the power this work held because, as she said, the techniques of theater are the techniques of communicating. So the last thing I'm going to leave you with is this. I came across this amazing passage from Viola that explains why she was the spark um, that ignited this new art form. And I, I think it'll be of particular interest to this audience. So in 1955, she, this is from a letter. It's like I have, I actually have copies here. I should show you. It's five single-spaced uh, typed pages in italics. Um, David Shepard was planning to write a book about how to start an improvisational theater. And she was saying, hold up. That's my work you're taught, you're <laughs> you were doing. Uh, and... Um, uh, she was reminding him that the, his, the work they were doing had a source, even if it didn't seem like it. He'd learned it through Paul and through workshops, and then they'd bring her out. Uh, but, um, but it felt sort of like it belonged to everyone, right? But she hadn't published her book yet, and it had a source, her and Neva Boyd. Uh, so I won't read you all five single space pages. Uh, but here's, the, here's, here's what I'll leave you with. Quote, I was trained to be a settlement house worker, a creative group worker by a great woman, Neva L. Boyd. She believed uh, in the right of creativity for all people, all caps. And she inspired in me this belief. We were taught games, handcraft, storytelling, a forgotten art, dramatic play, creative dramatics, folk dancing, fencing, gymnastics, camping, et cetera, et cetera. I studied with this woman more than 30 years ago, and she inspired me so with the right of the individual to his or her own creativity that I never lost sight of it. Loving the theater passionately, I directed my first play at eight years old, exclamation point. I moved from community work to put all my time into the theater. Being trained as a group worker, I was able to develop many techniques that the average theater person would not or could not have developed. For the combination of a creative group worker and a creative theater teacher is really remarkable. I worked to develop a tool for the average person. I sought to free my theater from exhibitionism and compulsion and competitiveness through actions, not words, techniques. I ate, slept, dreamed, and worked, much as a laboratory worker, always seeking the direct experiences that would be self-revealing, exciting, and refreshing, and yet carry the responsibility of the art form within them. I don't expect to get rich on my book. It is just that all the past years of work will be fulfilled. I simply want authorship. Yeah. I know. Here she is. Let's get there. Let's get Viola. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really, it's really it. I'm often correcting people about, you know, there's this line at Second City, they always say, she, she created work to help um, children communicate better and stuff like that. Yes, it does that. <laughs> it does a lot of things. But it's for, she created work, but uh, those two fields coming together. It was the meeting of those two fields in this committed and observant and curious and open person, a child of immigrants, a young woman with a spirit of adventure that created improvisational theater. 
And so all of us who practice it, we all carry the, the, the responsibilities of the art form, to use her phrase, in us as well. And that means using it to help others, to bring them into community and dialogue, um, and to help them transcend their own limits, and to go beyond what they know and what we know. <laughs> right? Um, so I will, I will, uh, I was going to read you some Martin Buber about this period we're in, but maybe we'll get to that. I'm going to stop it there for, for questions. Um, and see if anyone has it. You, what was it, Tony? Um, that's a really good question. Um, he, oh, okay, great. Thank you. I can repeat that question, though. Were they always able to support themselves and their families with uh, theater work or straight, you know? <laughs> Times were different. Um, they only ever, well, you know, Viola had a lot of jobs before, you know, she had this whole life before she published Improvisation for the Theater. She was a Rosie the Riveter in Oakland, and I mean, when she had to support her boys, she did a lot of different things. Um, but pretty much no. The answer is that they always did what they had to do, and they made their lives suit their income. Um, she lived in the funkiest house you can imagine, and it was beautiful, but hand-built. Whenever they had a little money, they'd just dig out some hillside and get guys from Second City to do it. And um, they lived, they were incredibly forward-thinking and bohemian, and they weren't interested in the trappings of middle-class culture or any, at all. So that was it was hard as a kid sometimes. Um, but they, they, you know, and there were periods of money, like Story Theater. My dad, bought, he bought the farm in Wisconsin so that there would be a place for us, you know. Um, we had a homestead. Uh, but they didn't, money was not something they worried about or sought. They always believed the money would come if they did the work they needed to do. And sometimes just enough to get by, but that, that was just how they lived and how they believed. Does that answer your question? Very much. It's, it's different now. Things are different now. They have no idea how much we need just to get by on the skin of our teeth. But luckily, you know, so a, a culture that, it, it, you know, it's, it's a big subject. When you, when you read, like, Harold Klerm in the fervent years, you know, about the group theater, it's all about raising enough money to do your work, isn't it? Uh, it, it's, it it's an ongoing question. And I know that must, uh, you know, a, a lot of the reason we need research and we need to, we know that this work works, but we need to prove it so that we can keep doing it, right? Because you've got to get through to the funders. Um, it's a big, it's a big subject. To go uh, wading in the sea of, in the bay of funding, they used to call it. They didn't like to go, they didn't. So Paul actually, instead of having a professorship, or uh, he couldn't, it wasn't in his nature to work within an institution. So he would have, he had a community theater in Door County with like bartenders and potters. He worked with schools, he worked with whoever he had and he made those casts pretty great through theater games. So like that was their ethos and they lived it for real. I mean, that's a good question, thank you. All the way in uh, the back. Oh, I'm sorry, oh, okay. first. Uh, so imagine if uh, we are last falling he, she came here today, and uh, we are teachers, so what, because sometimes we use her activities, games, so what she would tell us, like? Play the game. Um, <laughs> it's tough because uh, I know sometimes at these, uh, this is a talk, and it's very different from workshop, and so I don't have time, you know, like, <laughs> she would, we, you start, we, every workshop starts with a traditional children's game, from Neva Boyd, like um, we still call it Pussy Wants a Corner, but you'll have to change the name, I know, um, and or whatever, New York, no, uh, and then a space, uh, a feeling self with self, and then a spacewalk, and then um, every game, you, you never give the group, she would tell you, you never give them anything they're not ready for, you know, ease into it, and, um, but the main thing, I, I don't have time to give you a workshop right now, but she left us very good instructions. So um, dip in, and uh, it, but it, it does help to do workshop and then read this because it's a, she said it's like a cookbook. It's hard to read a cookbook and know what the food tastes like. You know, you gotta play. 
Um, oh, wait, all the way in the back. I'm sorry, I called to her first and then over here. Thank you, Barbara. So a two-part question. Uh, one is you spoke about research, and so I'm curious, what is the kind of research on play that we need today that is still forward thinking and not pointing towards capitalism <laughs> and seeking legitimization because that is furthering the agenda of the other, not Viola. So that's... That's a really good question. I really leave that up to you guys. Um, this is, I am in such a privileged position that I can teach pure spoil and, and not, I have to worry about paying my own rent. But, um, but I don't have to legitimize it um, because I'm lucky that people come to me for this reason. Uh, and so I am not in a position to answer that really good question. Is there anyone in the audience who has a thought about that? Because I, I don't want to leave you hanging. I think you probably know better. Than, or do you have a thought about it? No, I'm just opening it up for all of us to be in conversation because if yeah. we don't define the agenda, it will get defined for us, which is happening. Yeah. So I'm, I'm calling for an open whatever Oh, space. Gary has a thought. And, and one more question, and I'll pass the mic. Okay. About you, your mother, Carol Sills. You just mentioned her in passing, and I know it's not in the title, but it's got to be part of the story. It's a huge part of the story. So, yeah. any few words. Oh, yeah. Well, Carol, um, Carol is living. Uh, she um, lives in Wisconsin now. She married Paul in 1959, and so she was part of every single show um, that he did in some capacity from then on. So she's a great wealth of knowledge and um, of this information, she, of this, and information about this work. And she was Viola's editor for the second and third editions of Improvisation for the Theater, which was from the 80s on, and every, all the other books um, that, that were published after that. Um, the uh, Theater Games for the Lone Actor, which some of you may not know about. That's a helpful one. It's about side coaching yourself into the present time. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the director's handbook, Theater Games for Directors. Um, and she was an arts educator who came from Canada and um, where she worked with a great progressive arts educator who did group art forms, uh, murals, and group like clay building. And they'd have these like, these like beautiful multicultural, and this was like, this was, would have been the 40s and 50s in Canada where they would learn all about the pottery making techniques of an African village and then the whole, all these Canadian kids would do it and make a mural and make pots. And this was, the, this was the way she was educated in Canada, luckily enough. So she moved to Chicago to find out what was going on in the heartland. She wanted to work with Frank Lloyd Wright, but that was all falling apart. She ended up becoming a um, waitress at Second City um, and uh, she, where she met Paul, and when she said when she met Paul and Viola, she said those are my. Sh they were the first p people who uh, were speaking the same language of those kind of group art forms. And she was really, really excited by that. And they were Paul, she and Paul were both reading Martin Buber, uh, and so that was that. You know, <laughs> so that that's Carol in a nutshell. I could go on and on. Sorry. But thank you for asking. I do, a part of this is bringing, you know, the women of this history in back into the story and reminding everyone that the originators of this art form are women. Um, and she certainly played a huge role, especially in that game theater era when she was the women, she had, they had her murals all over the game theater. Um, um, and um, they were, mur uh, Women for Peace was making, was, she was a part of making murals. And so, uh, um, she was heavily engaged in Paul's activist spirit and I furthered that as well. Oh, Gary, back to Gary, sorry. Okay. She asked me about my mom, I'm sorry. Go on and on. So regarding the question of uh, the state of play and uh, uh, Viola used to say, she said, my, the, the salient point of her work is that it's not about competition and she, uh, she regarded competition as a toxic element to be sort of, it's, you, you have to use it in play, but it's not the ultimate aim. She said her work is about extending oneself to your full capacity and maybe beyond, and that is through pure play, and competition creates competitiveness, aggressiveness, uh, 
promotes uh, cheating, uh, uses the goal. So you go back to the very old saying, you know, it's not whether you win or lose, it is how you play the game. And I, that's been true ever in time immemorial. So we have to remember that. And don't use, don't use competition as the catalyst. Use play. Oh, I, f I misunderstood your question. I thought it was about research, but. Oh, was um, it about but, research? I'm sorry. Uh, but I like what Gary said. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Gary. Okay. We have, uh, uh, Bar oh, Barbara, you go ahead. Um, just timing, we probably have about 10 more yeah. minutes. Yeah, whatever you guys say, I'll answer. I'll go as long as you can stand it. You can, you gotta go somewhere else, I know. Uh, thank you so much for sharing these stories with us. Um, what kind of games did Viola play with you uh, when you were a kid, if any? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, not none. Okay. <laughs> we played games. She wasn't that interested in kids. <laughs> uh, I don't blame her. But, um, but yeah, no, she, she would talk to me. When we were one-on-one, -on -one, she would talk to me about stuff, uh, about her work. That's what she liked to talk about was her work. Um, but yeah, it's funny. No, she was, she, you know, we'd be there with Paul. They'd be talking, you know, they'd be into it. They taught, they had a lifelong conversation about the theater. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> so I don't know. We went off and did our own thing. Uh, but yeah, we played a ton of games and my, well, mostly back to my mother, Carol, um, and my dad too. We would get us doing some games, but he wasn't, it wasn't, he didn't work with kids either for obvious reason, but he, uh, he, but we played the games for, through, with Carol and, and then with each other. And luckily I had siblings and friends and we, we, would, we would do story theater and we'd make up our own shows and um, play lots and lots of games. I'm, that, oh, sorry. I have, I have, I'm, not yeah. I'm not Hedda. appointing. <laughs> sorry. It's yeah, my, yeah. yeah I, uh, no problem. Well, Go, you're, you're, I you'll, we'll get to you. <laughs> yeah, I rule. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you for the stories and and all the uh, all the stories about your mother and grandmother and all the important uh, people here. But I have um, um, I would love to ask you, how do you feel that maybe it's uh, are you standing in the shadow or spotlight of the legacy? How are you doing? I don't know if you answer that partly already because you can teach pure spoiling, but. I would love for you a little bit more. How are you doing? Oh, thank you. What a nice question. I'm, um, it's, it's an interesting thing, um, and it's complex. And I've learned over my life that when you're, when you're like the child of someone, everyone thinks you're incompetent. It's hilarious. Um, and I did, they just assume, it's like a natural assumption. And, and I don't blame them. Um, but I, I've had to learn how to teach uh, on my own, kind of, you know, and um, and that uh, Paul was my teacher, and he was an interesting figure to be the student of because he didn't teach like Viola did. Um, he was a director, you know, um, and not being someone who wanted to improvise, like many of you probably want, I, uh, some of you anyway, must have wanted to jump on the stage and improvise, and I was just terrified of it um that i i felt that that you know that that's part of who i am as a teacher is making everyone feel safe and you know uh welcome and um making sure uh you know so um i i do what i can i think um the thing that interests me um the thing that I, I feel like, I, do, I don't even know how to put it into words, but what I see happening, the improv world essentially entirely, almost entirely rejected Viola, right? And I see a, I see a and, and I think, well, that's stupid um, for a lot of reasons, because the work is so effective. It's so beautiful and good, and I get to see more of it. I think some people only get through like a first three-hour session, and they think, well, what was that? We didn't. Well, you know, I wasn't allowed to talk a lot. Um, 
And so I feel bad. And, you know, they leave it, it, But when you get into it and you realize it's so, Viola's work is so profound and endless and I, that I'm still just discovering it. And every time, and I will do games over and over again until I'm like, oh, like, I, <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. Um, oh, yes, you know, and then, and then a facet of it will become clear to me. And I still think, so basically, for me as a teacher, what, I have no problem just doing pure and full and improvisation. Um, but I work toward creating a class that helps people understand where it can lead. And, and people are now beginning to have an understanding of, oh, ensemble theater, devised theater, um, mindfulness, these, these this, uh, you know, elements of mindfulness in the theater, they all go back to Viola. So I feel like we've reached a turning point, and for me that's um, on, uh, and that there's a woman originator to this field, and it came out of women protecting each other and helping each other out. And, um, and, um, and so for me, this moment is really wonderful because I've, I've lived through many, many years of people asking me if I knew Del Close. But I, luckily, improvisers didn't, improv people didn't really come to my workshop, so it, I didn't have to deal with that much, actors and educators. Um, but this, we must stop doing that. It, this is, and, and, and so everyone who's been a little afraid to try Loyola or whatever, or you can't get Beyond Mirror and a few other games, um, get into it. Um, you're going to discover what you need in there. And the reason is because what she created, she was solving a problem as she did it. And as <laughs> so they still go back into the rehearsal process. They still, they, they go back, you know, they, they are still usable on every level. Or, and just as we've seen for communication. And it's so great that Alan Alda, like, brought out, you know, I've done Mirror for years and I, people, We'll talk about empathy. We'll talk about all the stuff that happens, the transformations in people when they play. Um, but like professional improvisers will tell me things like, I was so not wanting to play mirror. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. And then I cried, you know, because <laughs> that's the experience it has. It that so we're. I think we're all getting past that, and in part because of the applied improvisation movement, um, that people are seeing. Oh, look at all that it does. But we can't bypass. Um, Viola to do that, right? So, I mean, it's, anyway, I hope that answers your question. I rambled. This patient gentleman down here in the blue shirt really needs the mic. Uh, I'm not really patient. He, oh, okay. Yeah, uh, I'm going crazy inside, but, you know, fine. Yeah, he's <laughs> really moved by your talk. Thank I love you. the title about community and then what you did as you told us. To, first of all, when I listened to uh, Improv Nation in the car, I felt like I won something when I learned of a name, a strange name I'd never heard before, Viola Spolin, <laughs> as the originator of improv in America. It was like a, a treat. And then to hear your passion and to tell that story with those amazing women. And uh, and then, then you invited us into the family and legacy. That was generous of you, and I'm grateful for that. And my question w was Thank really, you. w you're welcome. And my question really was, when did this align in you? When did you? When did this become something that you knew that you had to be a voice for? Um, yeah, that it took a really, really long time. I'm a very slow learner. I always, I mean, I taught. Uh, uh, you know, I I studied with my dad from like being a teenager, and I started teaching when I was like in my mid twenties, um, and I had other fields. Uh, making that back to that making a living problem. You know, you, you always got to do something else, right? It's only in the last few years I just rely on this, and that's. Um, uh, uh, it, it was. Um, I started to just realize that I really needed to. I had spent a lot of time listening to Paul and working with Paul, and just feeling that their their voices needed to be raised. Viola's voice needed to be raised, so I began. Just I would do workshops, even though um, very few people would come. Like in Los Angeles, I would just do them to teach my to 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 learn how to teach. I just had these like really cheap workshops for friends and family. And, like Hamilton Camp Jr. was in it. Like people from the Mishpuka, as Viola called it, you know, and it would come and that take means family. Well, yeah, um, and uh, so yeah, just over the years, and so gradually I got to the point where 
even when I was working, I would do like one class a year or something. And just gradually I got to the point where I felt um, I would read Paul's notes and read Viola's book and bring their words out in workshops. So it changed for me how it felt. And then I went to grad school to get my MFA, and I learned how to be a better teacher by having all those problems that you encounter at trying to teach writing to kids. Like I was working with undergrads, but um, there were undergrads in a UC school. A lot of them didn't, you know, I, that hadn't had, um, they needed a lot of help. And so that was helpful to me too. So yeah, just over the years more and more, and just realizing there was a need and wanting to, and just getting annoyed <laughs> at seeing a lot of erasure, <laughs> you know? Um, we've had, I think we have time for one more. We had, be oh, quick. I see lots of hands. Oh. You can catch me later. Okay, if you, we can be super brief, we might be able to get to. All right, I'll. Yeah, this, this will be quite brief, actually. Loads of wonderful stuff, thank you very much. I was, can you tell me where we could find out more about that? I don't know where. Um, I have no where. To, that is stuff that she would talk about. And so that's all I have for you now. If in my research later um, I come up with it, um, going through papers and stuff, um, which and letters, which there are a lot of, um, I will post it. On our website is violaspolin.org, right here. Um, and um, I, there's a bio on there that right now I wrote it with the help of my mom, Carol. And um, right now that's pretty much the most uh, information, historical information about her available at, at right now. Um, but um, I'll, I'll update it. That's what I got. I told you what I got. Yeah. Yeah. You had, did you say there was, I, I told you, I told you everything I know. <laughs> okay, we have a question. Oh, thank you. Hey, Aretha. Thank Hi. you so much. Um, your grandmother's work is deeply personal to me as a social worker who improvises. And um, I've always felt that everything I do in life I approach as a social worker. Even now that I'm working in the corporate world, yes, I am a social worker. Yeah. And I'm Good. wondering if Viola saw herself as a social worker or more as a theater teacher, director. I think she thought of herself as everything. I don't think, I really believe she knew that this work was for everyone. And, and, and it was, she was just, that was deep in her bones. She knew, so who called it kindergarten for the 21st century? Gary, do you know who said that? I don't know who said that, but she, she liked that. She said that. So it was like, she knew that it went beyond theater and, and into every pocket of human uh, consciousness and understanding and relation and, so I think she was, that's how she saw herself. Uh, as Severn Darden said, I'll leave you, this was, our la Severn Darden said, Viola is too vast. <laughs> so we'll leave it, you know, that's the last. I think those are. <clears throat> <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you, Viola yeah. and Paul. <laughs>